Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. My name is Jeff Heitman. I am with the Lepanto Church of Christ. I am so happy to be here, and I hope you have your Bibles this morning. If you would, open your Bibles up with me. We're going to go to John chapter 3, as this morning we talk about how the Holy Spirit saves the sinner. Now, no Bible believer questions the fact that the Holy Spirit does save sinners. In John chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the Bible teaches the only way into the kingdom of God is by the new birth, a birth of water and Spirit. So the question is, how are they saved? Is it by the direct operation or through the influence of the gospel? This is what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to go to John chapter 6, and we're going to start with the testimony of Jesus. In John chapter 6, if you'll notice verses 44 and 45 with me, we find the Bible now saying, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, the Bible says, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, Cometh unto me. What I like about these verses that we've already looked at, and this verse in particular, Jesus says that one must be drawn, one must be persuaded, one must be pulled to Christ. And with this understanding about being pulled to Christ, if you go to 2 Thessalonians with me, because God's power to draw people to Christ is the gospel. So you look at such verses as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. And the Bible here says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, his call, his invitation is extended to humanity throughout the gospel. That's God's power to save. That's what we're looking at. God's calling, his invitation to be saved is through the gospel. Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because the next logical question would be asked, if this is how God calls us, what is the gospel? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find verses 1 through 4, 
where Paul writes, and he says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and he says, wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. You're saved by the gospel, he says. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you here, he says, first of all, number one, that I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, the story of God's love for humanity as revealed by the death, by the burial, and by the resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the very heart of the gospel that calls people. The gospel is that drawing power. It is God's power to save because it takes the spirit to beget a person. It takes that spirit. And in the understanding, it also gives him the right to be brought forth into the body of Christ. It gives him the right to be saved. Now we're going to keep 1 Corinthians marked for a few moments. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to go to the Great Commission because he also gave us the Great Commission to look at and to understand. So in Matthew chapter 28, the last three verses of that, verses 18 through 20, he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And what a great place for amen, because it means so be it. We agree with this. You know, if we look at Mark chapter 16, now in Mark chapter 16, of course, is the account of the Great Commission by Mark, and it's much the same. But Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. And he says, Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It was the Great Commission because this was to everyone, to everyone everywhere. The gospel is God's call, and that is why we must ring that message out. Now, when we look at such verses as Romans 10, 17, because we're talking about the gospel, talking about that's God's power to save, and the reason behind that in Romans 10, 17, because when one hears the message, they get faith. Not just by God randomly giving them something, as some people teach, but when we open up our Bibles, because Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, by your Bibles. If you want to keep Romans marked for a few minutes, and even go to Luke chapter 24, because the idea of getting faith, it's because God's word, the primary source of faith, gives us that understanding. In Luke 24, verse 45, Luke 24, 45 says this, Then he opened their understanding that they might comprehend or understand the scriptures. It's telling us without a doubt that we most certainly can open up our Bibles and we can get an understanding. We can know what God would have for us to do. We can know what God would want for us to follow. He opened their mind by the use of the sword of the Spirit. Now we go to such verses as 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'd like to look at verses 9 through 13. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13 says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. What a wonderful set of verses to look at. The wonders of this age were revealed by God to Paul and the other apostles through the Holy Spirit in connection with the Word of God. You see, when we go back to Romans chapter 1, because we're talking about the power of the gospel, we're talking about the influence of the Word of God here, you see that God calls us by the gospel because it is God's power to save. So Romans 1 verse 16 is what I'd like to look at. 
Romans 1, verse 16, Paul writes and says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is God's power unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is, when one believes, when one receives in his or her mind that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, at that point they have the power, they have the right to become a child of God. In this understanding, we go to the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 2, verse 37, because we have a testimony of examples in Acts. We start in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, and it says, listen closely. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, if you're reading the Bible for yourself, go back and look at that, because it says, when they heard, not when they felt this. The Holy Spirit did not directly contact the heart of that individual. Now, understand that the Holy Spirit did play a part. He did play a part, but that was through the Word of God. The people had been hearing the Word of God. They've, they're getting their faith. We noticed Romans 10, 17 once again. They're getting their faith through the Word of God. So now Acts 2, verse 40 and 41, he continues and he says, With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word, he says, were baptized. The same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine about 3,000 souls readily accepting the word of God? Here in the Bible, he tells us, save yourselves. What he says is, make a choice and act on it because it's your responsibility of doing whatever is required that God tells us to do, that God tells us to follow. All believers who welcomed that word were baptized for salvation. And today, all who have come to believe in him will require his word and will be baptized. Understanding that if we believe in God and in Christ Jesus, we will believe what God says that we must do to be saved. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Because in Acts 4, verse 4, still in the book of Acts, the Acts of Conversions, he says, How be it many of them which... Heard, believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000 souls. Do you notice the book here now it says they were converted after hearing the word of God. In Acts chapter 6 verse 7, we continue on and he says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And I look at this, and I know that there is an obvious connection between the Word of God increasing and the number of disciples increasing. An obvious connection because the more seed that is sown abroad, the greater the harvest of souls is. When the priests obeyed the faith, the gospel, the law of Christ, this is the Word of God. When they obeyed that form of doctrine, it was delivered to them. We can even go to Acts chapter 8. We notice Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch is a great example of this. In Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, they mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I love that line right there. And he says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and eunuch, and he baptized him. Philip preached Jesus. He preached the word to him. This means he preached the gospel. And since we know the basic facts of the gospel are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know that they were preached to him. This obviously included what a person must do to be saved. You know, matters relating to... Uh, Belief, which is faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. All these were preached to them. And they, you see that the word was preached, it was heard, it was received, and the fact that it was accepted. Then they that believed were baptized and then saved. I'm reminded of one very nice set of scripture that's in here. Keep Acts Mark for just a moment. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 8. Because the same is true today. Because God's word is just as true for us as it was for the first century Christians. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, he says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. What this is saying is Jesus does not change. God does not change. And the doctrine 
does not change. doesn't need to. Let's go back to the book of Acts chapter 10 now, because some will say that the Holy Spirit fell on some, and that's what saved them. What about the conversion of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2? Here it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Here we are introduced to Cornelius, who applied the fundamental principles of the law to himself and to his family. It says the fact that he was a devout man, but he was not a Christian. If you'll drop down to still in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48 with me. I love the way that it continues on to explain this, this. And it says, while Peter yet spake the words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many of them came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. By the way, did you notice it says the gift of the Holy Ghost and not the Holy Ghost? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. I like this example because it's teaching this. As Peter was speaking, as he was speaking these beautiful words, the Holy Spirit falls upon them which heard the word. Notice it says it falls on them that heard the word. What was the purpose of the Holy Spirit falling on them as some would teach they were saved? But what was the purpose for this? God showed his approval of the Gentiles receiving the gospel by pouring out his spirit on Cornelius and his household. They were immersed in the Holy Spirit, and they received the same gift of the Spirit the apostles received on the day of Pentecost. That is that of speaking in languages, not some babbling language that some people teach as well, but they spoke in languages. The twelve apostles were speaking in the other languages of people that were there. They spoke of the mighty words of God, and if you notice verse 46 here, it, it, it indicates that it's the same message as well. For they heard them speak with tongues. The same. This gift was not for the purpose of salvation, as you might think. When you go to Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 30, we need to see that it was for the reason of completing the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Joel 2, 28 says, And it shall come to pass... And afterwards I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass. For in the mount... Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You see, what it teaches is on the Pentecost of Acts chapter 2, the Spirit was poured out on all part of the flesh that was there. That's the Jews. Now here in Acts chapter 10, we see that the rest of all flesh that the Spirit was poured out on, which means Cornelius and his household, the Gentiles are now included in this. They received the Holy Spirit to prove to Peter and the rest that were there that the Gentiles have the right to receive the gospel, that they are accepted of God, and in doing so, that they have the right to be baptized for the remission of sins and be saved. Notice Acts chapter 10, verse, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 11, verse 14. Acts chapter 11, verse 14. This is after Acts chapter 10 when Cornelius and his household, they, they had the Holy Spirit falling on them, they believed they were baptized. Now we see in Acts 11, verse 14, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? They still needed to obey the gospel. Yes, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them, but it was poured out for a reason. It was poured out for God's approval. They, like everybody else, still needs to obey the gospel the same way. God's word, God's standard is the same for everybody. If we were to notice going to James chapter 1 now, 
We notice what James says in James chapter 1, verse 21. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. I love this verse when we deal with the word of God because it says we are to receive with humility the engrafted word. It says that it's what can save your soul. The word of God. The Bibles, once again, that you should be reading from this morning. This is what saves your soul. Read it. Understand it. The word is planted in us when we hear it, when we believe it. So we are planted with Christ. We are buried with him in baptism. And with this being understood of what James says, and, and James says this has a background for what Peter says. You go to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Now we see where it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls, and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now I want you to notice what he says next. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And then he clarifies, he goes on to say this. By the word of God. And you know what's important about the word of God as well? He says this, which liveth and abideth forever. So he's telling us, being born again. Peter, showing that being born again took place when you purified your souls in obeying the truth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, not of your own ways, but of the incorruptible. He says, by the word of God. This is powerful. This is so powerful, in fact, that he says that it liveth and abideth forever. We want this living in us because it's going to help us get to our goal of living with God for an eternity. Don't you want that? Don't you know that the Bible is that that gives us that? While you're still in Peter, if you'll go to 2 Peter for a moment, and you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. In 2 Peter 1, verse 3, the Bible now, and Peter, he says this, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything that you need to get by in life, every problem that you may have, you can find answers for in the Bible. He says this. He says, through the knowledge, and I like that word knowledge, the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Knowledge is power, and the Lord has much confidence in the power of his word. He expects no wait. He demands that people will hear it, will believe it, and will obey it. If he does this, shouldn't we be following that? Shouldn't we be listening? Shouldn't we be adhering to that word of God? The Holy Spirit saves sinners by the influence of the gospel. God calls us. He invites us through the gospel. His power into salvation to all who believe. The same word by which God uses to guide us into all truth when we read it and when we study it. When we open it up daily and find out what God would have us to do. I often tell people prayer is important because prayer is our way of talking to God. God's word, his Bible, is how he talks to us. If we're not reading our Bibles, how can God direct you? How can God help you? Just the same as if we are not praying, how can God hear us? How can God know what our problems are? How can we come to the Father and lay our problems at his feet if we're not speaking to him? Have you accepted the word of God? I hope you have. And if you haven't, let me help you this morning by quoting a few verses. Because the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, can help us and can direct us. The Holy Spirit is what can help us be saved, through the word of God. But he gives us the plan of salvation. He tells us first we must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We've looked at this already in our sermon but he's telling us we must hear the word of God. We must get our faith from the Bible. When we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, he says, which God did by him in the midst of you. What he's saying emphatically is, hear him. 
we may have very important people in our lives. Our mother and our fathers might have some very important things to teach us. But when it comes to matters of faith, we must seek God's word. When we look at John 5, 24, John 5, 24, and I notice this verse for this reason. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and then he goes on to say, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And I look at this verse because it tells us we must believe. We must believe wholeheartedly that Jesus died for our sins, that the reason for our salvation is through him. Hear him, he says. When we hear him, we believe. In John 8, 24, we're even noticing that he says, I said therefore unto you that you'll die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. We need to believe that he left that place of heaven. No problems whatsoever, no sin, void of sinner, void of any death and sorrow and pain. He left that for us. He says if we will believe him, if we will repent of our sins, in Luke 13, 3, and in again in verse 5, he, he repeats it. I tell you, they accept you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He says we must confess him before men. If we believe that, we will confess him before men. And most certainly, the Bible says in Acts 2.38, we must be baptized. We're baptized for the remission of sins, and that adds us to the body of Christ. I want you to do that if you have not already, and thank you for your time this morning. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.